No, hopefully everyone's uh, having a good day. Today we're going to learn about um, taking pictures of some birds, some big birds up in the sky. Right, Jeff? Yeah, big metal birds. Big metal right. birds. Just, <laughs> just got so a lot I of I want to uh, thank both Jeff and Steve from Tamara and the coming uh, and presenting today's seminar. Um, and hopefully uh, it'll be informative, educational, and enjoyable. So go for it, Jeff. Okay. I'll, uh, I'll just chime in here real quick. Just want to let people know that, uh, again, we thank Camera Company for hosting these events. And um, there are some special rebates going on, some special instant savings on lenses right now that goes through the end of the month. There is currently a, a Father's Day rebate that goes through the weekend that's in addition to addition, uh, the instant savings we have. So there's some extra savings right now. So you can contact the camera company for all the details on those. And um, there's always something good going on at the camera company and they have a lot of knowledgeable staff and, and I think they can help you out. Jeff, go ahead. Exactly. And uh, the, there are some uh, fantastic uh, bonus rebates on some of the uh, some of the most popular Tamron lenses out there. So the Father's Day event, uh, you know, even uh, for uh, if you just want to get one for yourself, we won't tell anybody. <laughs> <laughs> right. It's good time. But uh, yeah, good stuff. Anyway, I'll see if my screen will share here and it looks like it does. looks good. Your video is not, or your audio is not good, but. Oh, sorry. Um, my internet provider has been off and on all day today. And uh, my screen is just telling me my internet connection is not stable. So I'm actually broadcasting using uh, a. Uh, a hot spot. Okay. So um, if it if it drops out occasionally, my my sincere apologies. But uh, I the my uh, internet service provider was off for five straight hours this morning, so I didn't wow. want to take chances. And I, you know, fired up the hot spot and figured, well, we'll we'll get through it one way or another. So I apologize if uh, if uh, the the audio is spotty, but uh, we'll uh, we'll go as uh, as best we can. So, at any rate, again, thanks to uh, the camera company for hosting us today, and uh, always appreciate their support. We uh, we do many things uh, with the with the good folks there. Uh, both when we get back to doing in person presentations, we've done many many of them over the years, and uh, they've been very kind to host a number of our of our virtual webinars here too. So. Uh, without further ado, uh, we will start talking about airplane photography. If, uh, if we run into a question that doesn't get answered, and, and of course, uh, on the bottom of your screen, you can turn on chat and answer or ask questions at any time. And, and uh, <clears throat> Steve will be uh, monitoring that and trying to help out. And then we'll have question and answer at the, uh, at the end of the seminar as well. But I'm Tamron Tech Jeff on all the popular media. So you can always drop me a message that way too. And uh, uh, that way, if something comes up after the, the webinar has ended, uh, and you just say, oh, I forgot to ask that. Uh, there's your uh, there's your opportunity. And as I always like to do, I, get, I like to get started uh, by talking about controlling your camera before we actually get on to the photographs, uh, because it's important to know how your camera works. And I'm going to go over some of the basics. For those of you who are experienced photographers, this will be a little refresher for you. And for those of you who are new to adjustable or, or changeable lens cameras, um, there might be some, some good tips and pointers for you that, uh, that will help you uh, get on your way. So on your camera, you'll have a, an analog or, or an LCD uh, controller that will give you a number of things like an auto everything, a green box uh, where the camera simply does all the work for you. Uh, and it can be your best friend, but you don't want it to be your best friend forever because what can happen is you get uh, perfectly exposed blurs because uh, in a fully automatic mode, the camera just wants to give you a good exposure. It's like a loyal puppy. It wants to sit there, uh, you know, after you teach it to sit, uh, it wants to sit there at your heels and, and, uh, and try and please you, but it doesn't always know how to please you. So uh, it's important to get off of that auto uh, mode, especially when you're doing action or sports photography. 
because you're going to need to uh, to to tell the camera a little bit more about what's going on. Uh, you can go to the program mode and that gives you a little more control. You can also go to the scene modes. Most cameras have a dial or a control where you can go to scene settings and you might see a little head and shoulders that's for portraits, uh, maybe a flower for close-ups and a mountain for, uh, for, uh, for landscape photography. And then there's like a little running man and that's the action or sports photography mode. And that's a good starting point, again, if you're new to photography or if you just again want the camera to do a little more of the work for you and it'll set higher shutter speed probably a higher ISO uh, uh, and maybe even a little larger aperture uh, to allow that higher shutter speed uh, so that you're more uh, assured, assured of, of stopping action freezing motion so that's a good starting point and I also like to, to recommend uh, your camera will do uh, what I used to do when I started in, in photography, I shot film. You put a roll of film in and you'd go out and you'd shoot 36 pictures and I would take copious notes on a little spiral notepad and I would write down for, you know, frame one, I shot it at this shutter speed, I shot it at this aperture kind of thing. And I would have notepads and notepads and notepads of notes along with all of my, uh, my negatives and, or slides and prints in a box somewhere. So they were all kind of together and I could learn from that. I knew, you know, if I, if I came back with good sharp pictures, I knew that I was on the right track. And if I didn't come back with good sharp pictures, I could figure out, well, did I need a higher shutter speed? Did I need to use a faster film or in, or in our case, a higher ISO? Um, uh, or if I didn't have everything in focus in the foreground and the background that I wanted, I know I'd need to change my aperture. And so I learned from that. And the wonderful thing about digital cameras is that they record all of that data automatically for you. So every time you squeeze the shutter button and, and make an exposure, that recorded, uh, that in, information is recorded and you can go back and look on the, <clears throat> on the camera screen or after you've downloaded your photos, even most uh, editing programs uh, will allow you to look at ISO, shutter speed, aperture, and so on. So again, it's a great way of learning in the digital area what worked and what didn't work. And it's especially handy, uh, again, if you're shooting those scene modes to see where uh, maybe the scene modes are falling short. Now, I tend to shoot uh, in shutter priority for fast moving subjects like the planes in the air. And I'll tend to shoot aperture priority for uh, the display planes on the ramp on the ground. Uh, and uh, occasionally in certain lighting conditions, I will go to manual exposure. And I'll talk a little bit more about all these throughout the presentation. And I'll also talk about exposure compensation, which is a very important key because you'll have, as you see on our next photograph here, for instance, uh, fairly dark aircraft uh, uh, against a, a bright blue sky, and that can cause a camera's light meter to, uh, to be fooled. So here I was shooting uh, at an air show that was uh, surrounded by suburbs, so there wasn't a lot of aerobatics. It was mostly groups of planes doing uh, passes over the airfield, trailing smoke, and uh, a lot of opportunities for great pretty photographs. And in this one I was experimenting a little bit. I went to manual exposure and I wanted to get a little bit of motion blur in the smoke trails, uh, but have the planes nice and sharp. So I ended up at F-16, small aperture. I was at ISO 100 because it was a bright sunny day. And again, I'll expand more on these as we go through the presentation. And I ended up at an 80th of a second to get this shot. So again, as the planes are, are flying along, I am, I am following them in my viewfinder. And as I'm, as I'm firing, I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm panning with them and keeping them centered in the viewfinder. So even with a, you know, fairly fast moving planes in the sky, uh, because I was panning with them and keeping them centered, I got the, the aircraft nice and sharp, but I got that little blur to the, to the smoke trails that I was looking for. So kind of just an experimentation on my part. And I'm always trying new techniques too. And that's important as you're out shooting and learning, try new techniques and and again, see what works and what doesn't. And you may come up with a, with a new uh, interesting way of making photos. Uh, and these next two slides, again, you might, uh, especially the, the one after this, maybe uh, grab your phone and, or, uh, or do a quick screen grab with your camera because it'll, it'll give the suggested <clears throat> starting points for shutter speeds. 
pardon me, uh, 50 feet from my front door, there's a giant cottonwood tree that's spewing cotton out today. And that's, that's one of my demons. So I'll be uh, occasionally stopping for a, uh, a drink to try and uh, clear my throat. Uh, the allergies are, are strong today. At any rate, um, understanding shutter speed, it's pretty straightforward. The bigger the number, the faster the shutter opens and closes. So the higher the shutter speed, the better able you are to freeze motions to stop action. And as the shutter speed drops, if you have a moving subject, you may end up with a blurred subject. And that can be good for creative purposes, or it can be bad for if you want a short photograph. So again, controlling that shutter speed is, is going to be vital to, uh, to creating the the look in the photograph that you're interested in. Pardon me. If your subject is motionless, like uh, again, display planes on the ramp, slow shutter speeds are fine. A 60th of a second, maybe even a longer shutter speed if it's early morning, late afternoon when those light levels are lower and nothing is moving. And especially if you're using a wide angle lens, which may be uh, a common to be able to get a, uh, the, to fill up your frame with a, with a plane where you can stand nice and close to it on the ramp. And as things start to move, you're going to have to go to higher shutter speeds. Uh, a plane taxiing 125th to, to, to 250th of a second is going to be good. Uh, uh, soaring birds, as, as the example here, or, uh, or propeller planes, a 250th, maybe a 500th of a second. And as, uh, as they're faster moving planes in flight, you'll need to go to higher and higher shutter speeds uh, to, uh, or, or with birds to freeze all the feather motion. And uh, with really fast aerobatic teams, you'll probably have to go to a thousandth, two hundred, uh, two thousandths. And if your camera allows it, maybe even a four thousandth or an eight thousandth of a second. And again, I'll show examples of what works and what doesn't work in, in uh, when I've uh, been out in the field experimenting with different shutter speeds. Now for propeller planes, there is a magic number to get a little motion blur to the prop. A 250th of a second uh, just almost but not quite freezes the propeller in motion. So you get a little bit of prop blur and it makes, uh, again, photo editors like this. Um, the publisher of the magazine I was shooting for at the time was in the very back of this uh, of uh, this B-25 plane shooting where the, uh, the tail gunner would normally sit. And as this uh, other aircraft came up behind us, he had a full clear view of it. Now I was, uh, I was kind of along for the ride. So I was actually leaning out of the, uh, of the waste gunner's port uh, to, uh, to catch the plane. So I was shooting a little more blind and this ended up being a cover shot for the magazine. The publisher actually chose my photo uh, because it was interesting more than his just, you know, beautiful, uh, but just plain kind of more vanilla shots of, of uh, the aircraft that's called the rare bear there. And I, you know, again, a little skill, a little bit of luck. I, sh I was shooting at a 250th to get that prop blur. And uh, we were bouncing around late afternoon, a lot of turbulence in the air. Uh, but it was a fast enough shutter speed to get what I needed. I got a little reflection of the one aircraft off of the, uh, the trailing aircraft off of our aircraft. So it kind of carries that, uh, that view through the shots. So obviously access uh, can, can be uh, uh, an exciting thing to have. But again, keep those kinds of things in mind for shutter speeds. And then as we actually get out and start shooting uh, in, the, in the real world at an air show, pardon me, um, if you look at the upper left hand corner, you'll see the uh, the helicopter with the plane or with the car dangling from it. And they, you know, they, uh, this is kind of one of those fun things. They take an old junker car up a few hundred feet and then release it and drop it and see it smash. Uh, but at 125th of a second, I got great propeller blur, but the photo overall just isn't quite sharp. Uh, even with a stabilized lens, uh, I was uh, racked all the way out in the zoom. And, and again, it, I was uh, shooting handheld. Uh, so I ended up uh, going to that uh, 250th of a second. I still have a little bit of motion blur, but I also have that tack sharp photo. So uh, again, for planes in flight, a 250th is probably going to be your minimum. Same kind of situation uh, when we see that uh, the B-16 doing the flyover. 
Uh, I, was, uh, I was zoomed all the way out to 600 millimeters with my 150 to 600 handheld at a 250 to the second. So I got the nice propeller blur, uh, but uh, again, because I was uh, also, again, keeping the, the camera uh, centered and panning with the, uh, with the aircraft as I went, I got that, uh, the nice sharp photo of the plane but I got the prop blur that's so desirable. And then as we drop down to the bottom half of the screen, uh, the shot on the left, the Blue Angels, uh, and air shows often are two day events. And if you can, go both days and uh, that'll give you a chance to review your photos from day one and see what adjustments you need to make. And I was shooting not only uh, for, uh, for myself, but for Tamron. Uh, and I was, I was doing some experimentation with shutter speeds. So on day one, I was shooting at lower shutter speeds to see what I could get. And also I knew I could use them for, uh, for teaching too. So at a thousandth of a second, these two, uh, these two planes are approaching each other at a closure rate of somewhere north of a thousand miles an hour. They're both flying 500 miles or better uh, in, in this, uh, this pass. And as you can see, uh, at a thousandth of a second, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll pick up one plane uh, coming toward me and I'll pan and start shooting. And uh, as better with the lens cap off too, I'll pan and start shooting. Um, and at a thousandth of a second, the planes are just crossing over too fast. The, the back plane, which is the one I was tracking, uh, is sharp, but you'll notice the one in the foreground uh, is soft so simply because it was crossing so fast. So the next day, reviewed my photos overnight. The next day, I, uh, I got a nice crisp, sharp shot of the, of the planes uh, making a pass like that. And I had to go to a four thousandth of a second. Most modern cameras could probably do it at a two thousandth, but if your camera ha has a four thousandth for really fast action like this, or even an eight thousandth of a second shutter speed, not a lot of cameras have that, but four thousandth is now pretty common. Uh, check, your, uh, check your shutter control. And, uh, and if you have that much higher shutter speed, you're gonna get that much sharper result. So uh, those are important things to think about. Now I also mentioned aperture or depth of field. Now this is also sometimes referred to as the f-stop on your lens. And um, this is a, a mathematical equation. So it, it's somewhat um, uh, counterintuitive because here the small numbers represent the larger apertures because it's a mathematical formula of the diameter of the lens versus the focal length and how much light it passes through. So with uh, uh, if you have a zoom lens, you're gonna be probably at four, maybe 5.6, even up to 6.3 uh, at, at a telephoto end. Uh, and, and, or, you know, with faster lenses, you might have uh, maybe even 2.8. Uh, if you have fixed lenses, you might even go uh, larger than that f2. Uh, f1.4, and uh, those give you a huge volume of light so that you can go to higher shutter speeds without having to use higher ISO settings, uh, but they also uh, limit what's in focus. They limit your depth of field or the area of sharp focus. So generally when I'm shooting air shows, I'm going to be shooting at f8, f11 for planes in flight if I can, uh, just so I have a little bit of depth of field, uh, a little forgiveness in focus error too, because autofocusing lenses um, focus somewhere, and this is driven by the, the camera, not by the lens, but an autofocusing lens focuses somewhere within the depth of field of the aperture that you've given. It may not be totally precise, uh, but it's, it's good enough in most all shooting situations. But smaller apertures give us more depth of field, more area of sharp focus and focus forgiveness too. So uh, medium apertures are a good thing when you're shooting uh, at air shows. So you have a little bit of focus forgiveness as, as well as uh, a little depth of field. Now here's what depth of field will really do for you. Um, this little blue flower, obviously not an airplane, but a great example. Uh, at 2.8, large aperture, it's nice and sharp, and it's our intended subject in this scene. Now, as we begin to stop down, even at 5.6, you can see uh, there's a piece of lawn furniture in the background. And by F11, F16, F22, it doesn't come into focus, but it gets sharp enough that it starts to take the viewer's eye away 
from the uh, from the intended subject. So uh, you want to when you're out shooting, check your apertures, check your depth of field, and see if you need more or less. If you need to include more, go to those smaller apertures, f11, f16, f22, if the lens allows for it. Uh, or if you want to make sure that you're just isolating your subject, f6.3, f5.6, f4, 2.8. If again, if it allows, uh, and you're going to have that uh, that isolated subject. So uh, that that's important to, uh, to keep in consideration for all kinds of shooting situations, not just action. So as we get out onto the ramp, um, if you go to an air show and you have the opportunity to go with some sort of group that gets early access or late access, that's, that's kind of the, the bomb. That's the, the, the great thing to do. It, you can't always hook up with a group, uh, but if you can, it's, it's, always, uh, it's always a good idea to try and look for that. And I'll, I'll again sh I'll show you a couple examples where uh, having early or late access can really help. But uh, I will often find when I'm on the ramp, I'm going to shoot a fairly wide angle lens for a lot of things where I want to include a large portion of the aircraft. And with a wide angle, I can get closer and kind of eliminate people around me uh, on the ramp. Uh, also, you want to consider, again, the bright reflective surface like of that Lockheed Electra. Uh, that's the same kind of plane that Amelia Earhart flew. And the, uh, the person that owns this plane, this was a couple of years ago, one of her long-term goals is, uh, is actually trying to recreate in this aircraft, of course, with modern avionics and, and, uh, and radio communication equipment uh, to successfully complete uh, what Amelia Earhart uh, unfortunately fell short with. So, uh, you know, just a, a cool history note on that plane. But bright reflective surface, uh, a lot of it's the original aluminum. It's not painted over. Uh, so that reflective surface, you have to watch your, uh, uh, watch your, uh, 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 your view screen, review regularly. And again, I'll talk in a few moments about using exposure compensation. And this is the kind of subject where exposure compensation is, uh, uh, is important. I opened up almost two stops to make sure that, the, uh, that I got good exposure. Or I should say I stopped down two stops to get good exposure on the plane because it was so highly reflective. Uh, I also in post, and most of the, there's very little post-processing done, but here um, I did do a a little vignette around it just to uh, to darken the sky a little bit and uh, and even the uh, the area underneath the plane to add more emphasis to it. Typically, most of the shots you see have uh, have only minimal processing. There'll be levels adjustments and and maybe a little contrast tweak to make them look good on the on your uh, on your screen. And as we move on, I'll experiment and change lenses. And like I'll take a, a close focusing lens like the Tamron 90 millimeter macro and I'll get in for tight detail, a very, very sharp lens. Uh, and uh, I could, I got the, uh, the mechanics working on this airplane's motor and then I got in nice and tight and got the, uh, the, the manufacturer's serial number plate off of, uh, off of the motor. So I knew actually uh, all kinds of information, the serial number, when the motor was built and so on. So just that little kind of detail stuff is always interesting. Again, as we drop to the bottom half of the screen, uh, a little bit uh, wider angle shot, uh, or actually kind of a normal field of view with the 45 millimeter, that's Tamron short normal lens, uh, the, you know, our equivalent to the Nifty 50. And the reason we went with 45 is a number of reasons, but um, it equates the focal length of your eye. Your eye is a 43 millimeter focal length. And a lot of early 35 millimeter film cameras actually came with, uh, with uh, 40 and 45 millimeter lenses because it was a very comfortable focal length to shoot with. And, and we've kind of gone back to that. Uh, Tamron goes back to our roots in, those, uh, in some lens designs like that. But uh, this lens is good for, again, getting good detail on a, on a larger scale and also very good close-up detail. Those are the marker lights on the wingtip of that same airplane. So again, work the subject in, and if you have access, move around it, you know, get underneath, shoot little detail items like that. And it just makes for uh, a much more compelling, interesting photo story that you can tell, not just, you know, a, a great portrait of a plane after a great portrait of a plane, because that's uh, somewhat easier to do. But look for those little details that make your, uh, uh, your, um, 
your uh, uh, photo uh, story more interesting. And here's another thing. This is the shot with the 85 millimeter lens, which is typically considered a portrait lens. Uh, but it again has good close up capability. So I, I, I shot the wing tip, again, that marker light on an, on an airplane and I shot wide open and you can see how fast uh, the depth of field or the area of sharp focus falls off when you're shooting at a large aperture like that, especially if you add a little bit of telephoto because that adds magnification, which also decreases depth of field. And I, uh, for the second shot at F16, I didn't keep my same focus point. I actually focused about a third of the way into the scene and that allowed me to keep the, the wingtip focused, but also I got the cockpit in focus and even the clouds in the sky aren't perfect, but they're, they're fairly sharp. Uh, so you can, this is what we call uh, maximizing or carrying the depth of field, uh, sometimes referred to as the hyperfocal uh, distance. And there are even apps that you can download for your phone that will tell you how to get maximum depth of field and, and where to focus a lens uh, at any aperture and with most focal lengths. Uh, I, there's something called Photo Pills, P-I-L-S, and uh, that's a great app. It's a pay for app, but it'll give you all kinds of exposure and depth of field data that you can use when you're out in the field. Very handy tool. Now I'll talk briefly, I've talked about uh, ex understanding ISO. Now this is the sensitivity of your camera's imaging sensor to light, and you can turn it up or turn it down. Most uh, modern cameras come uh, uh, built with an ISO uh, native sensitivity of around 100 or 200. Uh, if, there's a few a little bit slower, and uh, there are a couple that even go much, much higher. Uh, there's a, a new camera from Sony, their, their mirrorless uh, 7S series cameras that have a native ISO of 51,200. They're purpose built for shooting in low light, of course. Uh, so they're, they're kind of a, you know, a niche tool that not every photographer is going to need. But most of our cameras can do well, even at higher ISOs. And uh, here's, here's a, an assignment for you. Uh, go out and take your camera out maybe to uh, your backyard or a nearby park or something and shoot a series of photos. Uh, I'll usually go out late afternoon or at dusk. Set the camera up on a tripod so everything is sturdy. Turn stabilization off if, you, if you're uh, locked down on your tripod and shoot a series of pictures at different ISOs. Same subject and maybe shoot at a really low ISO, 50 or 100 if your camera goes that low uh, and then maybe 200, 400. 800, 1600, 3200, uh, 6400, and even maybe a couple of uh, steps beyond that if you wanna see what your camera is capable of. Then bring them in, look at them on your computer, but more importantly, uh, maybe even uh, make some prints or, ta or take the files over to, uh, uh, to camera company and have them make some eight by tens for you. They're pretty affordable or you can even sit at their, uh, now that they're opening back up, you can even sit at their, uh, uh, their workstations and just uh, do the work yourself. And, uh, and in a few minutes, you, uh, uh, their, their lab is able to hand you prints. And the reason I say eight by tens is so that you can see what, the, uh, what, the, what we call noise looks like when you enlarge your photo. Uh, and it's important to know that so you, that you know if you're in lower light shooting situations, how high an ISO you're gonna be comfortable with. Maybe, maybe your camera only gives you results that you're happy with up to 800 ISO. Maybe it can go to 1600 or 3200 or even 6400. Um, uh, I, for, for a birding seminar I, I did, recently I went out the night before the seminar to, to freshen it up and I shot at some ridiculously high ISOs. I, I apologize, I probably should have included those in this presentation, but just to see what my camera could do. And it was well beyond where I would make anything in a very, you know, any size print, certainly nothing uh, larger than a five by seven, but just know what your camera does or if you have multiple cameras, do that same experiment with each camera because even if they're the same brand, different sensors, see light differently. So that's kind of important. Again, you might want to take a screenshot of this. The lower ISOs are again for daylight photography, uh, low light, non-moving subjects. And as the subject starts to move, you're going to want to go to higher and higher ISOs. As you can see on this bright daylight shot of this very fast moving P-38 uh, uh, lightning aircraft, I was at ISO 800 to get the, to get the exposure that I wanted. Um, again, 
I was shooting at 600 millimeters. I was shooting at a, at a pretty far distance. And I actually, this is a bit of a crop from the original photo. Uh, but ISO 800 gave me the, my 250th of a second shutter speed, and it allowed me to stop down to the minimum aperture of the lens, which in that case is f22. So I was able to get my shot, uh, get the exposure I wanted, and also, um, uh, again, keep the ISO low enough so that if I wanted to make a big print of this, I would be able to do so as well. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about exposure compensation because I've mentioned it a few times. And again, something important, this is a camera light meter's worst scenario here. Uh, and you see scenes like this all the time with airplanes in the sky too. Uh, you're going to have the planes against a blue sky or maybe if it's cloudy against that, that bright overcast dull uh, gray but very bright sky. And a light meter is designed to record kind of an average uh, if you were to take even this scene and put it into a big blender and mix it up, you would come up with a kind of a middle gray glob of, of, uh, of, uh, of goo in the blender. But that gray glob is what a, a light meter exposes for. So it can be fooled easily if your subject is backlit or spotlit. So in a backlit situation like this, I've got a fairly dark subject against a very bright background. So we had to open up or tell the exposure compensation to actually overexpose so that the person and the dog uh, have nice detail in their faces and they're not just silhouettes against the snow. So uh, that's an important thing to learn about your light meter. Now it's gonna be a control on your camera that'll look probably like one of these examples. It might be an analog dial. It might be a button that has a plus minus on it or it might be uh, something on an LCD panel on the top or the back of, this, of the camera. Um, and this is a good thing to uh, know your owner's manual, or if you're not an owner's manual reader, uh, your camera manufacturer will have tutorials on their website about how to use exposure compensation. It'll probably be on their YouTube channel uh, or, or maybe uh, some other tutorial that, uh, that the body makers uh, all put out great videos on the controls of your cameras. So uh, learn about exposure compensation from there and, and it'll, uh, it'll uh, help you get more good shots in a wider variety of shooting situations and you're not coming back with blown out highlights uh, or, uh, or, or silhouettes where you don't want them. And here's kind of a couple of examples. Again, by, uh, by underexposing one or two stops, we create that nice dark mood. We get that silhouette of the, uh, of the, of the, uh, of the skyline, the city skyline. Uh, the sun is, is going to be overexposed no matter what. It's going to be that bright glowing orb. But through the clouds, it, it darkens it a little bit. It adds a little more mystery to a scene like that. Uh, but what you may need is if we go to those plus settings, and these minus settings are good if you have a very bright subject against a dark background. You may have to tell the camera to underexpose because it'll see a darker background uh, and it'll tend to make the, uh, the subject too bright because it thinks it needs more light. So minus one, minus two for a bright subject against dark background. Conversely, a darker subject against a light background, you probably have to go to a plus one or maybe a plus two. Uh, many cameras will go to three or four stops over and under, and those are for only extreme situations. Again, a good, uh, here's another good assignment for you. Go out in the backyard or to the park or something and play with your camera and uh, find subjects that are backlit. Uh, or bright subjects against dark backgrounds and, ex you know, leave the camera in, in uh, its normal matrix metering mode or, uh, or evaluative metering and, uh, and uh, play with those exposure compensations so that when you get out in the field and you, you know you're going to need to use them, you'll know how they work. Now, another thing to think about is stability when you're out in the field. Uh, at air shows, you're likely to be out uh, maybe you know, four, six, eight, twelve. Uh, you know, some air shows. I'm out for 18 hours from, you know, from from dawn till after dark, doing uh, doing doing different styles and different types of photographs. But uh, for for your meat and potatoes photography, a monopod can be one of your best friends. Setting your camera up on a monopod, it's just a, it's a one-legged tripod basically, and 
normally when you're shooting, you've got your your elbows crooked up. Uh, you're you know you're you're maybe leaning over a little bit to uh, to see through the viewfinder. And if you do that for hours on end, you walk away from an event, from an air show, from your you know from your kids or grandkids soccer games or or baseball games or football games or whatever, and you're you're hunched over and you know it hurts. So a monopod takes all the weight off of your neck and shoulders. You can relax your arms a little bit and you put the weight of your camera and your lens on that. And you're very mobile with that. Now, if you're in a stationary position or where you're going to be, you know, maybe during uh, the aerobatic portions of air shows, if you can, uh, maybe also consider bringing a tripod and spreading it out. Now, uh, you have to be careful. Obviously, tripods can be a trip hazard for people around you, but if you're, you know, there's usually uh, places, uh, if you can get to the front of the show or off to one end of the show, uh, you know, uh, the ends of the airfield. Most of my shots, uh, I, I did this presentation the other day and somebody said, you shot most of these from Air Show Center, didn't you? And I said, yeah. And he said, I like to get out to the ends of the airfield uh, away from the big crowds. And it's a, it's a valid point that I didn't bring up, but I'm, I'm gonna bring up today. Uh, you get a different look and a different feel of the air show if you're not right at Air Show Center. You know, they do all the tricks and all the passes at Air Show Center uh, so that, you know, again, you the, the crowd gets the maximum thrill. But as a photographer, you might wanna get away from the crowds and look for those, you know, those uh, areas at the, at the ends of the crowds where the planes are coming in approaching before they do their passes. And you can still follow them through. And this is where a tripod is handy and also uh, the folks at, at camera company can explain to you what tripod and monopod is going to work for you and that little hoo-ha up in the uh, up in the upper right hand corner is called a gimbal head and this can go on a monopod but more effectively on a tripod and what it does is uh, I, I should have set one up it allows you to tilt and pan very smoothly uh, up you know tilting up and down and panning left and right, and it, it smooths everything out. So uh, nature and wildlife, bird photographers swear, swear by these, uh, aviation photographers, especially people shooting with longer telephoto lenses, swear by these because it, it allows you to follow your subject much more smoothly, keep it more centered in your viewfinder easier. And it is a, a good investment as a tool for, again, birding and air shows and things like that, especially with long lenses. So again, the folks at, uh, at the store can explain what they have and, and make recommendations that are going to fit uh, your needs and, of course, your budget, too, because they're going to have uh, likely different price points of these tools that are, that are going to suit your needs. Uh, a few things about composition. Um, I, we always called you know, for years when I when I took art, even before I took photography, the rule of thirds, and I, I'm a little more loose. I like to call it the suggestion of thirds, but you know, rules or suggestions. Um, try and put something, a subject in your frame, so that it's about a third of the way in from one edge or the other, and also a third of the way in for the top or the bottom. Avoid cutting subjects in half if you can, and this is true for almost any photo scene, other than maybe reflections of of uh, some you know mountains or clouds uh, on a lake. There, there a middle horizon is acceptable. But for most other scenes, you want to try and keep off center, a little higher, a little lower, a little left, a little right. Uh, look for uh, groups of things, groups of three. Our brains like to see that psychologically. It's been proven that odd numbers uh, are, are a little better in photos than even numbers as far as the viewers uh, looking at a photograph longer. Uh, look for leading lines. And this can be like wingtips. It can be, uh, uh, you know, airstrips or, or whatever. It's hard to find leading lines in, uh, in aerobatics, but even sometimes the smoke trails that planes leave uh, can be a, a kind of a leading line to bring the viewer's eye to the main area of emphasis. So look for things like that when you're out shooting too. Now we'll get into choosing lenses now. Again, I'm with Tamron, so these are our lenses and the, the lenses in our product lineup. You may find uh, that you have similar lenses in your camera bag already, and that's great. Uh, I, again, I'll be talking about Tamron because it's what I'm most familiar with, but you know, regardless of the brand of lenses you own, uh, you probably, you may already own similar things. So it's, you know, certainly we'd love you to run into camera company and buy a whole new bag full of Tamron lenses, but I'm also realistic. And so if you have, is what you have is working for you, 
fantastic. So I'll give you a, a quick little uh, overview of the, of the types of lenses. And these are our lens designations. The DI lenses are what we call our full frame lenses. These will fit on full frame DSLRs or mirrorless cameras, uh, and they'll fit on pretty much any camera that you can adapt them to with adapters. And there's all kinds of adapters, even to put different, uh, different uh, body mount lenses on, on different body, on different brands of camera bodies. So those things are, uh, are all possible with full frame lenses or DI lenses. And DI uh, initially meant digitally integrated. And of course, all of the lenses in our product lineup, as from most other manufacturers, are now digitally integrated, digitally optimized, uh, with a few exceptions occasionally. But for the most part, anything new that you're likely to find on the shelf is going to be a digitally optimized lens. So it's going to give you the best performance on a digital camera. And still, you know, I occasionally break out the old, uh, the old film camera. Uh, in fact, I, I bought this baby used from uh, uh, from camera company last time I was in just because it uh, it, re, it was uh, a camera that I used to own in the film days. And I still shoot a, a roller to a black and white film through it now and then. And on to DI2 lenses. Now, these are our lenses that are optimized for crop sensor cameras. And again, they will fit on, on some cameras, uh, even that are not crop sensor via adapters, but mostly they're designed for the APS-C cameras. And these are the cameras that are most commonly available that most of us use that have a, a, an imaging sensor that is slightly smaller than a 35 millimeter film frame, roughly by about a third. Uh, so you may hear the term crop factor. Uh, most cameras have, a, uh, APS cameras have a crop factor of 1.5 or 1.6 times. So if you wanted to get an effective uh, magnification as to, uh, as it relates to a full frame 35 uh, camera or a full frame digital body, you add that magnification factor. But basically, since you're viewing through the lens, what you see is what you get. So again, the, uh, the folks at the store, if you're looking for a new lens, can explain which model lenses are gonna work on your camera. And again, help you find the ones that are gonna fit your needs best. Uh, so that's DI2. And then we have kind of a catch-all DI3. And these are our lenses right now. And we'll probably eventually have to come up with a subgrouping of these two. But for right now, the DI3 lenses are all of the lenses that Tamron makes that fit the mirrorless, uh, the new generation of mirrorless cameras. And we have uh, a full lineup of lenses to fit the Sony uh, full frame and crop sensor mirrorless cameras because simply they have the biggest market share and they were also the first company to license us to be able to make lenses to fit their cameras. So we have more lenses for Sony mirrorless than for anybody else. But uh, Canon and Nikon, we have a full uh, lineup and most of our uh, DI and DI2 lenses will fit the new uh, R and Z series cameras via the body makers adapters. Uh, sometimes there needs to be a firmware update uh, done to the lens uh, in order to make it uh, be able to completely uh, uh, communicate with the new cameras. But uh, again, that's coming. And, and as, uh, as time goes on, certainly we're gonna be introducing new lenses all the time for new different platforms and uh, uh, you know, watch for new product announcements because the factory generally doesn't tell us until, uh, you know, when, when we see the press release happen because, uh, again, uh, it's, you know, it's corporate secrets and they don't want us blabbing about it beforehand. Also use technology to your advantage. Tamron uh, in most of our lenses has uh, image stabilization built into the lenses. We call it vibration compensation. If not, we'll have like most of our Sony mount lenses use the in-body stabilization that's built into the Sony cameras. And, and so we don't need to build in a stabilizer uh, because it's in the camera and that allows us to make the lens is a little smaller and lighter as well, which is never a bad thing. But for traditional SLR lenses, uh, for most of the Canons and Nikons, we're going to have this VC stabilizer built in and it allows us to shoot at, uh, in lower light at longer focal lengths and minimize camera shake or lens shake. So it's a, it's a big tool that can help you get 
better results, especially in, uh, in uh, poor lighting conditions. So uh, it's a handy tool to have built in. Now above about a 500th of a second, a stabilizer has little if any effect, but below a 500th of a second, it can have a, a major effect. So uh, again, that's important. If you're on a, a tripod, uh, switch the stabilization off, uh, or if you're panning, and the lens has a panning uh, switch in, again, check your owner's manual. Uh, if it has a panning motion stabilization, then you can leave that on for panning even on a tripod. Now, some other settings that you wanna set on your camera, uh, you'll probably want your, your focus to uh, AI servo or continuous focus. Again, check your owner's manual to see what your manufacturer calls uh, the continuous autofocus. I like to shoot spot focus in my camera or I'll shoot with a small group right in the center. Most of our cameras will have a control uh, on the back of the camera. It's a little hard to see here because black on black, but again, there will be a little dial somewhere in the back of the camera that'll be under your thumb when you're shooting. And uh, again, check your owner's manual or manufacturer tutorials. You can usually move those focus points around. So, um, that's how I do it. I'll move focus points to where I want to, to where I expect my subject to be. And that way, again, I don't have to have that, that center uh, of, the, of the frame filled with, the, with part of the subject. Uh, some people prefer, uh, there are tracking focus modes. Again, refer to your owner's manual or your manufacturer's tutorials for this. Uh, Nikon has 3D autofocus that one of my colleagues swears by. Uh, again, when I'm shooting my Nikons, I still actually prefer the, uh, uh, the, the spot or small group. But again, that's, that's up to you to experiment with and, and that's why you get out and experiment. Uh, again, set your camera to the high speed uh, continuous frame advance so that when you start firing, the camera will go click, 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 click and, and fire as you're following your subject so that you're gonna have more opportunity to get just the right shot. High ISO, as I've talked about, use that if you need it, especially on cloudy days, you're gonna need higher ISOs to get high shutter speeds uh, to get the shots that you want. And sometimes um, manual focus, which I don't have on this slide, can be very important. If you use a teleconverter, you may have to turn on manual focus because teleconverters increase your magnification, but they decrease the amount of light coming through the lens. Uh, so it can cause autofocus sensors not to be able to, to have enough light to see to focus. And also try auto ISO if you're shooting manual exposure. For instance, you might have a specific shutter speed and aperture that you wanna use. Maybe you're shooting propeller planes and you want that 250th of a second at F8, but it's a partly cloudy day. So sometimes it's bright, sometimes it's a little darker. Uh, auto ISO does the same thing as any other automatic exposure mode. You set your shutter speed and aperture, you tell the camera auto ISO, again, refer to your manual or the, owner, or, the, or the manufacturer's tutorials, and it will vary the ISO up and down and you can still maintain the precise shutter speed aperture combination you want. So again, it's a new tool. Most newer camera bodies have that. So check your manual or again, your, your body makers tutorials. So let's get out and experiment with our lenses. Move around, don't always shoot from your normal standing height. Again, sometimes you wanna take the camera off the monopod or the tripod and do some handheld shots, especially on the ramp. Uh, you're gonna to wanna to be more mobile. Uh, zoom in and zoom out with your zoom lens. If you have a, a prime or fixed lens, you know, physically move in and out. And even with zoom lenses, move your feet too. Uh, don't always shoot, like I said, at your normal standing height. Get down low. I'll carry uh, knee pads, uh, like construction knee pads that you can get at the hardware store uh, or, or a gardener's kneeling pad. Throw that down and I can kneel at a, you know, on concrete or dirt or grass or weeds. It makes it uh, uh, so that it's less painful to kneel and also easier to stand back up. And just, uh, uh, play with uh, play with composition in your frame. Look for subject placement. Don't always put everything smack in the middle. Uh, look for environment. Maybe shoot a little wider angle than you would think you want because you can always crop later in post. Uh, and then also play with your depth of field to see if you want to just have that short depth of field to emphasize the subject or if you want deep depth of field to put the subject in its environment. So we get out to shoot. And again, I mentioned earlier about if you can get access, uh, this was at an air show up in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. 
and the local commemorative Air Force group uh, that restores airplanes, uh, you know, vintage warbirds, uh, brings in, uh, does uh, every, every, this is a every three year event because they share an air show with two other uh, airfields around the country. And um, they'll have a hangar dance the night before the air show starts. And they'll invite pilots to, uh, to bring their aircraft over, park them in the hangar or on the ramp just outside the hangar. They'll light them up. Uh, often they'll have uh, people in period costume. They generally do kind of a World War II because uh, again, most of the vintage aircraft tend to be from that era. And, uh, and it, it gives you, uh, you know, this costs like a $20 contribution to get into the dance. And you can talk to reenactors. You can talk to, I, at this particular show, I even met a, a gentleman uh, who was a, a World War II Marine aircraft pilot. And uh, he, still, he still has an operative real estate license in Minnesota. And he's a realtor as well. And he's, he's into his late 80s or early 90s. And uh, just spry and a wonderful guy to talk to. Uh, but again, he's, he's another great subject to shoot. But in this situation, again, with vintage aircraft and especially early morning, late evening, where, where you have lower light levels, maybe come back, shoot your shots in color, but then maybe convert them to black and white because it's going to give you that, uh, and I added a little sepia tone to this as well. And this is one of those few post-production things I did. I, again, I changed my crop to make it a more uh, horizontal frame filler. And um, I, I converted it to black and white with a little sepia. And it makes it look very vintage, very old timey. So that's something to think about in your, in your post-production workflow too. Um, and again, as you're, as you're on the ramp, work the subject. Maybe start kind of wide. I started with a 10 to 24 millimeter lens on a crop sensor camera here. So I've got uh, you know, over a hundred degree field of view at 10 millimeters. I'm at a, a 104 degrees. So I've got a, a very wide field. Now, as you can see, my shadow is in the subject. Uh, there are people standing around the plane. These are the, the you know, the crew from the plane. Uh, and in tight quarters at, at uh, this was at the Reno Air Races, the people are, are allowed to drive their crews, uh, uh, RVs and things uh, to work on the planes right up onto the airfield. So uh, it gets to be kind of chaotic. So start wide, but start moving in uh, and zooming in and using your feet and moving around. Uh, the shot with this 24 to 70 where you see the engine cowling on the plane with the sun just kind of peeking around. Uh, very, be very careful if you're shooting with the sun in your frame, especially if you have an optical viewfinder, not electronic viewfinder, uh, because it can, uh, especially in, with wide angle lenses, that pinpoint of light can conceivably uh, do damage to your eye. I have a couple of burn spots on my retina that my, uh, that happened years ago. And every, uh, you know, every other year when I go in to see my ophthalmologist, he, he cautions me about making sure I don't damage that any further. But that little, that little specular highlight that you get from the sun, uh, about half the sun in the frame, half the sun out of the frame. Stop way down, go to F16, uh, you know, at least F11, F16, F22, and you'll get that beautiful starburst effect. And that's kind of a fun thing. You're not going to want it in every, every shot, but uh, it, it's kind of neat. And then again, get closer and closer and look for more and more detail as you're working the scene and just work on emphasizing the detail. Also, you want to look for the good light. Uh, in this case, they had the engine cowlings off. They were working on one of these uh, fantastic V12 Merlin engines uh, that helped win World War II in, in, uh, uh, in, these, uh, in these vintage uh, P-51 and, and uh, a number of the British aircraft used a, a similar engine or the same engine. And uh, with the sun behind my back in the left-hand frame, uh, you lose all the detail in the shadows. But by stepping around to the other side of the plane, you're in the shadow area already. So you're able to open up, you're going to drop your shutter speed, you're going to open up your aperture a little bit, or maybe boost your ISO. But you can see all that detail inside the engine cowling that you really couldn't see uh, from the sunny side. So again, look for the good light and sometimes the shadow is the good light for you. So keep that in mind. Also working the ramp, look for those cool interesting um, nose art uh, collections. Uh, pilots are, are very, uh, you know, have 
good senses of humor and they'll put all kinds of, of interesting nose art or liveries on their aircraft. Uh, you'll notice that uh, that's that, uh, that B-25 that uh, Tamron sponsored that I was also photographing from uh, in, in the air of uh, when we saw that chase plane earlier in the presentation. So, uh, you know, we got to uh, put our logo in speed tape and, and uh, put it up on the aircraft. So fun things like that. And just keep looking for that moment. Uh, this was at the very end of a day at an air show and I, we were actually, it was, we were all leaving. And I saw this vintage airplane uh, that had a blue painted fuselage and, uh, and it, the color of the fuselage was close to the color of the sky. And I saw that and I thought, this needs to be the moment. They, they, they had placed the propellers just right for me there. Uh, so they were just peeking up over the edges of the wing and I was leaning right on the, the, you know, right on basically the back edge of the wing, but it got all the people out of the photograph. And I had that nice calm uh, color carrying through the scene. And it's just, uh, you know, it just, in my mind, uh, this is a shot that I printed and framed and enlarged. It's on my wall here in my office. Uh, just one of those kind of nice serene moments uh, that, uh, that in the chaos of hundreds or thousands of people uh, attending an air show, I found this shot and it was just kind of one of my little Zen moments. And again, if you have access before hours or after hours, uh, if you can go with a group, look for that great light. This was sunset. Uh, you saw this, uh, this same aircraft in the air uh, several frames ago. And uh, I shot this uh, as it was parked on the ramp and uh, got the sun again, kind of peeking through around the, uh, around the engine cowling there and got that nice starburst. And this is something where you do have to do some exposure experimentation because obviously the sun will tend to silhouette everything. So here I did use the uh, exposure compensation and even opening up two stops, I didn't get a lot of detail in that shadow area there, uh, but uh, it's, uh, it, it really creates a nice mood. So if you can get access and, and keep looking for that good light. So when the planes get in the air, then you're going to want to look for uh, formation flying for demonstration teams. I shot this just a few weeks ago. Um, the Thunderbirds uh, came into Colorado where I live uh, to do a flyby at the Air Force Academy as they do every year uh, when the cadets graduate. And because of the COVID crisis was, was really in full swing, uh, when the Air Force Academy held its graduation a few weeks earlier than normal, the uh, Thunderbirds did a flyover all over uh, northern and southern, uh, uh, the eastern uh, edge of the Rockies in Colorado. So I was able to get something unique. Uh, they weren't doing any aerobatics. It was just a salute to the first responders and the medical workers and everybody who were on the front lines uh, fighting the, uh, the COVID crisis. Uh, so I got not only the main six aircraft, uh, but the two additional aircraft that, uh, that travel with the Thunderbirds uh, that they use mostly for PR and for missing man formations. But it's really unusual to see all of them in the air flying together at the same time. So they posted a, uh, uh, an itinerary and, and the Blue Angels and the Thunderbirds I know and some National Guard units have been flying around the country and doing these salutes to the uh, to the medical workers and first responders uh, over the last couple of months. Uh, the, they published a very detailed uh, flight plan for where they were gonna be and when they were gonna be there. And uh, I guess to within a mile of where they actually flew. So I was pretty happy. I was able to fill up the frame with the 150 to 600. I forgot to label that uh, on this particular image. Uh, but they were still flying fast and I, I didn't see them right away and it took a, a few moments to acquire focus. So they were actually just passing me and, and just passed me when I finally kind of got the shot that I wanted. And then a, a few weeks later, the Colorado Air National Guard did the same thing, but they weren't nearly as precise in publishing their flight plan. Uh, so I went to where I thought they were gonna be, uh, at a, at a, you know, I was in the middle of a parking lot at a state park and, and again, it was a weekday, so there was no one around me. I was perfectly socially distanced, but they were only probably three miles away from me. Uh, but I got lucky because of where they were flying. I had a, a great background. So uh, I kind of posted this on my social media as, 
uh, what I thought was, you know, this was the best I could get that day, but I got dozens and dozens of dozens of comments about what a great shot uh, the people that looked at my, uh, my Instagram and Facebook pages uh, thought it was just a great shot. So what I thought was a kind of a throwaway shot ended up being very well liked by, uh, by my fans. So I was, I was gratified by that. And again here, I knew it was going to be a silhouette uh, because I had those clouds in the sky and I wanted to expose for uh, the snow that was still on the front range of the Rockies at that time. And uh, again, you, you don't always get what you want, uh, but sometimes, uh, again, with a little planning and a little luck, you'll still get a, a, a unique kind of cool shot. So, so back to being close proximity at the air show, you want to look for peak action. Uh, the wing walker, you know, sideways on the plane kind of, kind of says it all in that upper left-hand corner. And then, you know, uh, aerobatic planes will fly up and kind of do a hammerhead stall. And that can be for an interesting shot, but they leave their smoke generator on. So you'll lose them in the smoke, but when they, when they, uh, when they, uh, when they kick the rudder and 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 step on the uh, the aileron, uh, then they start that tumble downward, and and that's kind of the, what I consider the peak action shot. So you get kind of that that question mark look as the plane is coming around out of its smoke cloud, because uh, you know a few frames before that up there, uh, the plane was still obscured in the smoke. Uh, look for at air, show, air shows, especially for those juxtapositions where you see. Uh, the vintage aircraft flying alongside modern aircraft, and this is what they call a heritage flight, and it will happen generally. They'll bring two, three, four, sometimes five planes from different eras, and they'll fly them a few laps around the airfield, and uh, it makes for some unique, uh, uh, unique uh, uh, shots. So, you know, again, that that modern jet uh, tactical fighter against the uh, the vintage World War II tactical fighter. And then down in the lower right-hand frame there, uh, this again was at the Reno Air Race, and uh, the uh, the Arkansas Air National Guard's F-16 team was doing a, a quick uh, flyby a few feet above the deck over the runway as a uh, one of the race planes was taxiing out. And I saw the F-16 coming, and I saw the uh, the other plane taxiing. So I again, I focused on the plane that was taxiing and just started firing as I could hear the F-16 approaching, and I got that shot. Again, a little bit of motion blur in the jet because it was moving so fast, but I think it, it makes for kind of a fun shot. And then as the aerobatic teams are doing uh, their maneuvers, try and get them out of their smoke, uh, uh, smoke uh, tails. And again, this is where you kind of want to hope there's a little bit of breeze blowing so it keeps blowing the smoke away from the airfield and you're not shooting uh, 45 minutes or 90 minutes of, of uh, planes in smoky haze. And, you know, usually airports are built where there's going to be a breeze because planes take off into the wind. Um, and you'll find that uh, usually there's enough of a breeze blowing unless it's just one of those, and it happens, those warm, sticky, humid afternoons that, that can occasionally occur where there just isn't any wind. But uh, you, you make the best of those days too, and your, your, your shots are going to look different because after the first couple of passes, they're just going to keep flying through their smoke trails that, that are hanging there. But if you can, uh, get them like that as they're trailing away from you or as they're coming back out of maneuver down toward the airfield. Again, these were shot at, at the ends of the airfield on practice days when I wasn't allowed onto the airfield. So uh, different places uh, at the north and the south end of the runway to get those kind kinds of shots. And then, you know, we want to look a little bit at solving problems because when you're out on the out on the flight line, you never know what you're going to get. These shots, these next few shots were, were shot by my, uh, my colleague Armando. He lives in Southern California. So he went down to San Diego for the, uh, for the Red Bull air races and he didn't quite know what to expect. So he started with his 70 to 200 to eight because he was pretty close to these race pylons that the, the pilots have to fly through uh, as, as part of their race maneuvers. And he just wasn't quite getting what he'd hoped for. And again, here you can see he didn't have quite enough, uh, quite enough shutter speed either. So he learned pretty quickly uh, what to look for. He added here the 1.4 match teleconverter on the 70, 70 to 200. And Tamron does make a 1.4 and two times match teleconverters and they're specifically for four of our popular telephoto lenses, the 70 to 200 28, the 70 to 210 F4, 
uh, the 100 to 400 and the 150 to 600. Now on the 70 to 200 and the, uh, and the 70 to 210, because they're pretty fast, F2.8 and F4, the 1.4 will usually still let you maintain autofocus, uh, but there's enough light loss. You lose one stop of light with a 1.4 converter, and this is any brand, uh, and two stops of light with the, with the two times converter. So that can cause the autofocusing sensor in your camera enough of a light loss to not be able to see what's happening. And so there you want to, uh, uh, you'll have to probably go to manual focus if you're using a teleconverter. So he still wasn't quite pleased with the, with the 70 to 200 and the 1.4. And uh, he was also using a crop sensor camera. So he had that additional uh, 1.5 times uh, magnification or crop factor. So he broke out the big gun, got out the 150 to 600 with the 1.4 converter, manual focused, and then he was really getting the shots that he wanted with, with enough magnification. And you can't get nearly close enough, especially, I don't think the Red Bull Air Race series uh, is, is going on anymore. I think that uh, Red Bull decided to stop throwing money at that a uh, year or so ago, but you'll see air races or similar kind of uh, competitions around the country. And in addition to regular air shows, these are fun competitions to shoot. Again, when, when shooting, uh, this is more of a compositional tip than anything else. I shot this with the one, uh, one to 400 at 400 on a crop sensor camera with the 1.4 tele, teleconverter. Uh, and I was manually focusing, but You'll notice I also leave some room at uh, in the frame. So I've got my one third composition there, the area there where the plane is about a third of the way in from the uh, uh, from the left hand side of the frame. But I also give it almost two thirds of the frame of just blank space to fly into. If the nose of the plane was closer to the edge of the frame, it adds a lot of tension to the composition and that can make for a less pleasing composition. So crop a little bit loose in these kinds of situations, give your subject a little room to move into. And this is with almost any action subject. It's good to give them a little bit of room in front of the direction the subject is moving uh, to have that space. Again, I did it here with the, uh, with the, blue, uh, with the blue angels. And this is a situation, give your, uh, give your subject some room to breathe and notice the difference in color balance. It's not a bad idea and the folks at, uh, at a camera company can also help you with custom white balance tools. Not a bad idea to custom white balance because look at the difference in color on this bright uh, blear, uh, blue sky day uh, versus a cloudy overcast day. Completely different color uh, off, you know, from both the sky, obviously, but even the light reflected off the planes. So uh, keep custom white balance in mind, uh, and it can give you more precise color, especially if you're, if you have an overcast or a partly cloudy day, you'll have more consistent color, or if you're shooting two days in a row. Again, the, the blue sky day one day, the cloudy day the next day, completely different look to the shot. Um, it's not a bad idea even to shoot the birds as they're uh, flying away from you. Uh, another cool thing to think about with longer telephoto lenses, I generally, I'm shooting mostly uh, in about the 100 to 3 or 400 millimeter range, but if I crop in real tight uh, with, the, with the 150 to 600, I also get what's called telephoto compression. These planes look like they're way too close to each other to be safe. Now they're flying a safe distance apart, but with telephoto compression, it makes it look like they're just stacked right on top of each other. So again, that's not what the, the human eye saw, but it makes for a really compelling kind of cool photograph. Again, if you can go multiple days to an air show, uh, you'll have an idea of what and when the different stunts and things happen uh, in the performance. They fly the same routine at every air show uh, week in and week out, which of course saves them from crashing into each other. And they practice for months before the air show season starts, especially if they, you know, sometimes pilots will retire or go back to regular combat duty. They'll have new pilots coming in that need to learn everything. So again, they, they practice and, you know, two days in a row, you're going to see pretty much the same show. And two months later, if you go to a different air show and see the same aerobatic team, you're going to see about the same show. So uh, again, it's, it's good to go two days in a row so that you learn from what they do the first day to the second day, and you're more prepared for, uh, for getting the cool shots. Now, this is one of those things where they are 
you know, almost centered in the middle of the frame, uh, about the same distance above and below them, and to the left and to the right. And it's one of those uh, compositional circumstances that with this particular situation, I just thought it looked right. Uh, maybe when they're doing these big uh, aerobatic maneuvers where they all trail smoke and go up and then split back off, follow just one plane. Don't try and get the whole group or, or zoom in and catch them as they're coming out the top and then stay zoomed in and, and again, just follow one plane. So as they come down, you get that, that kind of very unique look as it's coming out of its dive and, uh, and recovering back to, uh, to, to looping into a level flight and climbing back out. Uh, again, custom white balance, never a bad thing to consider. Uh, and watch your exposure. Again, sometimes it's not a bad idea to ex overexpose just a smidgen uh, rather than underexposing just a smidgen because you can, you can always darken it a little bit, but it's harder to bring detail out from an underexposed shot. Always bring air protection, very important. Military aircraft especially, and, and most stunt or aerobatic planes, even propeller planes, don't have mufflers on their engines. They're very loud. I know uh, from, from doing years of air shows and standing on, uh, on or near stages at concerts and sporting events with those, you know, loud PA systems and even just, you know, plinking around with, uh, uh, with rifles and, and pistols when I was a kid. I have bad hearing loss. Uh, protect your ears. Bring earplugs, wear earmuffs, whatever, uh, and, you know, you'll save your hearing. Uh, a couple of last points. Uh, this shot was planned in my head for over a week before I got to the air show. I was actually uh, working in Oregon at a nature photography conference uh, doing workshops and I was watching the moon rising later and later every night and setting later and later every morning and I'm thinking wow I'm going from Oregon to Texas to do the air show and on Saturday and Sunday at the air show the moon should be uh, about the time the air show starts, by the time the jets start flying, in a good position to maybe get a jet flying in front of it. So you know, a week before I got to the air show, I had already envisioned in my mind what I was going to do. This was day two of the air show because day one, the moon sets about 45 minutes later every day. The moon was a little high the first day, but I thought, you know, it's going to be enough lower the second day. And I got lucky. So again, this is with the camera in burst mode. I was shooting. I have a camera, uh, the Nikon D500 that shoots 10 frames a second. And I was firing away. I, I uh, acquired the camera or the plane uh, with the 18 to 400 at 400 millimeters and I was just hoping the pilot was going to swing up past the moon and as luck would have it he did. Now again he's flying you can see in full afterburner he was going close to 600 miles an hour here. You can see that uh, that flame cone uh, or that flame trail coming out of the tail cone uh, the vapor coming off of, uh, uh, because it was a humid day, you get that vapor trail coming off of, uh, of the plane uh, going through the humid air. And uh, the frame before this, the moon wasn't in the shot. The frame after this, the plane was just, uh, was past the moon. It, it was still in the shot, but that was the shot. And also be aware, you notice this looks a little bit grainy, a little bit noisy on your screen. This is a 75% crop. The original shot was done horizontal, so I had plenty of cropping room. I knew I was going to need to crop, so I shot a little bit loose, even at 400 millimeters. Um, and so this is a 75% crop from horizontal to vertical and uh, it's a little bit noisy but with the sharpness of, of my Tamron lens and with the sharpness of the sensor in that camera I still have a very uh, a very enlargeable photo uh, that you see here up uh, over my shoulder on the uh, on my wall too so again that's uh, important to think about things like that uh, know how uh, again what your camera is going to do if you have to crop uh, and I was shooting at ISO 800 to get this shot at a thousandth of a second at F8. So uh, again, I've tried to include some of the exposure information as I was talking, uh, but your results are going to be different unless you were standing next to me on the day I shot that with the same camera and the same lens. Your exposure results would be slightly different. So uh, good starting points on all this, and I'll say that that's the end.
I will again, uh, once again, thank our, our hosts at Camera Company for inviting us out to do these webinars. Uh, we've had, uh, I've done several of them now and several of my colleagues have done them as well. I'm Tamron Tech Jeff and I'll turn it back over here. Uh, and there we go. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks. Thanks, Jeff. I don't, I don't see a lot of questions in our chat box there. Nope. <laughs> so if there's any questions, this is the time to ask. Absolutely. We're here to help. And uh, I've, I've either entertained you all or I've, uh, I've bored you to death. I'm not sure which. <laughs> I Very are. interesting. Yeah. You always got some good stuff. So, so I've, I've tried to incorporate in my presentation as it's evolved, you know, the questions I've been getting asked, which may be why we don't have, uh, have a lot of questions from the group right now. But uh, again, uh -huh. If anything's come up, you can always uh, drop me a direct message and uh, maybe uh, end up with a few reminders about the, uh, the Tamron um, uh, rebates and the Father's Day special bonus rebates too. Steve, you can uh, go over those again if you'd like. Yeah, it's, it's something that uh, <clears throat> they change about every month, but uh, some of the deals are the best time of the year uh, to buy them is, is right now with the Father's Day and the, the monthly instant savings and uh, Father's Day. So, so you get a question. Yeah, and I, rather than just typing my answer in, because I don't type fast, um, the 18 to 400 and the 100 to 400, uh, you use them both. Congratulations, you're a, uh, you're a wise consumer. Uh, the 18 to 400 is my go-to lens for almost every shooting situation because I can go from wide to powerful telephoto um, to, you know, it'll focus down to, uh, uh, to under 18 inches and give me a one to, uh, to 3.5 uh, macro ratio for extreme close-ups. Um, it is, however, a crop sensor lens, so I only use it on my crop sensor body. The 100 to 400, a scotch sharper because it's a shorter zoom range. Uh, and that's just the physics of, of lens manufacturing. And it is a full frame lens, so it'll work either on a crop sensor or a full frame body. So it gives me more versatility in that way. Uh, but, I, but I do lose the versatility of the, of the wide range. So if, uh, if maximum sharpness, and I know I'm just gonna use the telephoto end, I'll probably lean on the 100 to 400, but on my, on my D500 camera, um, the, the, the 18 to 400 is on it almost every time I walk out the door. Yeah, I use that lens probably 75% of the time um, on a crop sensor. Absolutely. And, and, and that's you know, one of the lenses that actually has uh, a Father's Day extra special deal on it. So those yeah. are 649 with the Father's Day, the, the instant savings and the Father's Day promotion, they're 549. And there are select lenses that do have uh, free circular polarizers. Um, so that particular lens is one of the lenses that has it. That's a $160 circular polarizer that you get absolutely free. <laughs> But that's yeah, why I was saying uh, the deals are really good. There are other lenses that also come with three circular polarizers. So check with the guys at the camera company and they can fill you in on all the details on those. Yeah, and that's that's a legitimate $160, I think, value for that uh, for that lens. And it's not a cheap filter. It is a top-notch first-class filter. I use that brand of filter myself. And you know, again, I I have to I have to put the the best uh, the best glass in front of my glass so that I'm certain that I'm going to get great performance and that uh, that ProMaster filter uh, definitely is is no slouch. There are different price points of filters and, and that's a high-end filter that anybody would be proud to own and when they're throwing it in with the purchase of a lens it's you know that's a nearly $200 additional savings uh, right now, so that's a, that's a great value, and and we uh, we thank the camera company for uh, for doing that promotion with us as well. All right, well, I guess if there's no other questions, it's time to wrap it up. But I, I guess so. And thanks again, Jeff. Thanks, Ed. And thank uh, you. Thank you. Thank everyone for coming today. We appreciate it. Thank you.
see you on down the road some sometime. All hopefully. right. We'll, we'll probably continue to come up with uh, with new topics for webinars and. Uh, I know you're working on new stuff. So. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Nose and to the Steve, grindstone. Yeah. Yes. And Steve, next week we have a one on the history of Tamron, right? That's right. Oh. Uh, that's coming up same time, 3.30 on Thursday. Uh, history oh. of Tamron. So, yeah, yeah, we, we okay. have an interesting history. That'll be a fun webinar. I'm not doing yeah, that Yeah, actually, one. that's one I, I actually did one similar to that the other day. Um, but... Uh, I always like sharing a lot of that information. So, yeah. yeah, yeah we, and, it, and it leads to, for those people that don't know anything about Tamron, it's like, why should I buy Tamron? Why, yeah. why do you think it's as good as the other stuff? And, you know, it, it leads to a lot of questions and good answers. And um, so I'm looking forward to that one too. Yeah. We, we come from humble beginnings. We started as a, uh, uh, you know, building test equipment for other lens manufacturers, other lens and optical manufacturers, and uh, evolved to building lenses with our name on them. And, and uh, you know, I'm not going to give away the whole webinar, but, uh, you know, now we're the world's largest independent lens maker, and we are a huge OEM, meaning that we build lenses that other people buy from us and put their names on. Right. <laughs> all right. We'll see you all later. Yeah.